Welcome everyone for joining uh, us today at Current 2023. I am Mons Nilsson, um, the Executive Director of SEI. Um, SEI is a research institute uh, based uh, in Stockholm with the headquarters, but we have offices around the world. Uh, our basic mission is to connect science and policy to develop solutions for a sustainable future. And our work spans uh, various topics within sustainable development, climate, water, air, land use, and also topics of governance and gender and the, uh, the economy, health. Um, we are fulfilling this mandate through uh, developing research, thinking about the future within these topics, but obviously part of fulfilling our mandate is really to think about the forces that affect our work and the work of people around the world to uh, limit climate change and promote sustainable development goals. So this goes beyond the remit of the normal sustainability topics and our research is affected by number of issues such as inflation and the energy crisis, uh, the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, the Russian war in Ukraine and many more topics. And they influence climate action and they influence how the world and different countries around the world uh, approach sustainable development. And this brings us to currents. We're in our second year of doing this uh, webinar. Why do we do it? Well, we live in a time of profound technological, political, social and economic change, and it's fundamentally uncertain what the world uh, and future can be and how it should be. The essence of currents is to think about what lies ahead and how forces affect our global trajectory to sustainability. It is maybe not our everyday work. Um, we are not mm, forecasters. We don't predict the futures and it's not based on the modeling tools that we have, but we bring in a global perspective um, and a dispersed perspective from different parts of the world where we are present and the foundation of our 34 years of research and engagement experience. So the currents we're discussing today are based on insights from experts who work around the world. They have emerged from interviews and discussions with our colleagues, from surveys of partners, and with input and insights from our Science Advisory Council. So these are starting points for discussion and debate, not bets on the future. And you know, if the pandemic has taught us anything, it is to expect the unexpected. So today we brought together six panelists to help us think about how these currents push and pull, divert, accelerate, and whether and how we should swim against the currents or go with the flow, or prepare ourselves to face a riptide or maybe an undercurrent that we don't, do not see. So these panelists will bring diverse perspectives, I'm sure, on what these currents may bring and help us think differently about the issues we contend with in our daily lives and our work. And I will now, with these introductory words, hand over to uh, Rob Watt, our communications director and head of policy engagement, um, who will move forward with the programme. Thank you very much for joining. Thank you very much, Mons. Uh, a very warm welcome to everybody. I'm going to give a, a short introduction, a summary of the four currents um, that we've identified uh, in our crowdsourcing uh, uh, exercise across the institute and across uh, all of the centres we have. Um, as Mon said, we have four of these, um, and the first of them is the democracy deficit. Um, it's quite extraordinary that over the last four years, there have been 12 coup attempts and coups in the Sahel region of Western Africa, and that a number of different academic studies have shown that levels of democracy are shrinking and have shrunk to levels not seen since 1989. Indeed, about 70% of the world's population 
lives under some form of dictatorship. But it's not only um, the increase in dictatorship um, that these studies are noticing, it's also an autocratizing of democracies. Um, the introduction of uh, restrictions in the uh, freedom of speech and for civil societies. 35 countries had significant deteriorations in freedom of expression in just the last year. But on the other hand, um, while the events uh, in Brasilia after the recent election are perhaps more example, another example of this uh, deterioration in uh, the uh, democratic uh, 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 trends, um, there is also a sense that perhaps there's some resilience here uh, because uh, those protests, the storming of the, the, the presidential palace was not successful. So really that leaves us with some questions about what, uh, where does the state of democracy go from here? Um, can we uh, identify some causes of this rising authoritarianism? And what are the implications for sustainable development and climate change? We can go to the next of our uh, currents and we've called this one the meaning crisis. Um, many of you will be familiar with the experience in social media of being exposed to uh, bots and fake accounts. Um, the fact that computational propaganda seems to be filling our news feeds is certainly creating uh, a mistrust in, uh, uh, in facts uh, and opinions. This is to be compounded by the rise of technologies that allow deep fakes to be creative. But there's an underlying current here, which is the economic incentive in many cases to uh, produce these uh, fake news, this uh, invented reality, because clickbaits are economically uh, uh, valuable. They, uh, th we, we know that uh, posts that uh, talk about hate or lies actually generate more interest. But it's not only in the domain of media and social media that this is uh, prevalent. The meaning crisis is also a crisis in, in politics and in business. And the rise of greenwashing and the uh, highlight that has been placed on the need to counter greenwashing is another facet of this meaning crisis. How can we be sure that the claims that governments and companies are making in terms of their uh, emission reductions or commitments to ESG actually translate into real world change? That leaves us with uh, some questions for today. H have we reached peak propaganda? And how can we actually work on these collective challenges, climate change and sustainable development, if, if we're all able to have our own facts? We can go to our third current, please, which is the rising cost of living. Um, and I think I can just say that uh, the cost of living crisis, I think, is probably has been uh, cited at the top of the uh, World Economic Forum's uh, risk uh, report today. So this is uh, obviously one that is really critical and it's it's critical because we see it as being uh, something that obviously has, has 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 is coming to the fore because of inflation and that has partly been uh, a result of the uh, coming out of the pandemic coming out of the stimuluses of that pandemic, but it's also the energy crisis and the energy uh, inflation crisis that we've seen. In fact, we're now talking about different types of inflation. There's climate inflation, greenflation. There are a number of different ways in which um, this is being translated into uh, the cost of living crisis that we see. One of the most uh, uh, important ways in which we need to consider this is the impact on food prices and the FAO has said that food prices are now at the highest levels since they started keeping records uh, 
And there's quite clearly a link between that and the potential for a seismic hunger uh, crisis to take place, which may then also be exacerbated in weather events. There's a link here also between the energy crisis and, and, and food price inflation. Since fertilizers that are so crucial uh, for food production rely on uh, energy, and as energy uh, prices increase, so does fertilizer, which is then has a knock on effect on the food prices as well. These things are deeply interlinked. The current really does push and pull, or, uh, but also accelerate um, these, uh, uh, these trends. The another dimension of the cost of living crisis is also around um, the resources for the new net zero technologies, where monopolization by some countries and some actors of these uh, resources, uh, particularly rare earths and other minerals, can also have an impact on the cost of the transition. So on the one hand, while energy crisis and the increase in gas prices, for example, might be an incentive to transition faster. On the other hand, we may be facing a headwind when it comes to the access and cost of the resources that are needed. So do we now see a sense in which supply chains are transmitting inflation and transmitting greenflation? How might that affect the pace of the transition that's needed? to reach net zero. And I think we can take our fourth and final current now. And our fourth current is around technology and equity. A fourth industrial revolution has already begun and it's, it's created by technological advances that have radically altered how we live, work and interact. And artificial intelligence and AI is a key driver of this disruption. It's really forging ahead and it's largely in the absence of regulation. There's a huge potential here for AI to contribute to the achievement of collective sustainable development and, and the welfare of societies. It can help to personalise learning. It can support medical advances, it can even help to solve the climate crisis and some of our own research has been looking at how uh, artificial intelligence can help to sort of uh, help to predict where permafrost is most likely to be melting. But at the same time, the evidence is that there's a huge digital divide, a digital divide about access uh, to the technologies that uh, enable us to use things like AI. There's also a huge divide in terms of the uh, data uh, that is needed often to fuel the AI uh, revolution. And we also know that AI can be used to come back again to our meaning crisis as a way uh, to uh, create fakes. So the, the potential is certainly there, but the governance of AI is lacking. What are the implications of this for equality, for data protection, for privacy and for the transparency of decision making? How can we make sure that technological power is used as a force for good rather than as a tool that further divides people? Those are our four currents um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing the panel discuss these. As Mon said, they're not a set of predictions. This isn't a forecast. It's really a starting point for a dialogue. And I'd like to, to leave the panel perhaps with some ideas around these undercurrents and potential riptides um, that also feature here. And the undercurrents that I think run through and, and, and really are influencing all of the, the currents that we have identified are things such as inequality, such as the development imperative, whether that is in terms of growth and seeking growth, or whether it is in terms of needing the energy and access to energy in order to ensure the provision of basic services and the, the growth of uh, small and medium sized enterprises. It's an undercurrent perhaps also around debt, where the debt that has been taken on by many countries and now with rising interest rates 
um, and with inflation is becoming more difficult to service. And then there are riptides, things that we really do want to avoid. And these seem to be the riptides of conflict, of disaster exacerbated by extreme weather events, but also by development choices that put people in the pathway of danger. So some of those are perhaps also worth reflecting on when we discuss our four currents. It's a real pleasure for me now to hand over um, to our moderator for our panel discussion and to briefly introduce our panel. So um, I would like to just uh, quickly introduce uh, them. And our moderator is Laurie, Laurie Goering. Uh, Laurie is the uh, climate change editor at Times and Reuters Foundation. Laurie, thank you so much for joining us again. This is the second year we've done it and you were a wonderful moderator last year and we're great, it's a great pleasure to have you with us again this time. And then our panel, our six fantastic panelists. Um, I'll start by introducing Aaron Abba Ghosh, uh, who is the CEO of the Council on Energy, Environment and Water and also a member of the UN Secretary General's high level expert group on the net zero emissions commitments of non state entities. Aaron Abba, a very warm welcome. Um, we also have Aram Tal, who is senior climate change specialist at the World Bank. Aram, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to see you uh, again. We also have uh, Lauri Militivera, who is air pollution and climate expert at the Center for Research on Energy and Clean Air. Manuel Pulgar Vidal, a very warm welcome to you, who is uh, the leader on climate uh, and energy practice at WWF International. And then we also have uh, Sean Aid, uh, Aid Hislop Parsons, who is a partner at Portland Communications with a real specialist in corporate reputation. I know has also been working on net zero commitments for FTSE 100 companies, so has a real insight into questions perhaps around greenwashing, among other things. Um, and lastly, Orsa Pashon, who is Research Director and Deputy Director at SEI. Welcome all of you. Thank you very much for taking the time. Really looking forward to hearing your reflections on these currents and also perhaps other things that you think will be breaking the surface and influencing the uh, international sustainability agenda this year in 2023. Over to you, Larry. Hi, thanks so much, Rob, and, and welcome to this panel discussion. I think we've got uh, some fascinating people here and a, a lot of really interesting things to talk about. It, it struck me listening to what, what Monson and uh, Rob said that what we're facing really is a lot of very complex and interrelated problems that we need to solve basically at the same time while the space for solving them is getting smaller, which is which is really problematic. And it, it's a time of thinking ahead, really. I know I was uh, at the World Economic Forum uh, event this morning and they were saying, you know, this is this is really a time where everybody has to think very seriously in a, in a profound and realistic way, and yet also an optimistic way about the future and how we get prepared for, for what's coming, what's here, and how we how we deal with this. So I'd just like to, to open up and, and ask um, initially just, you know, what you see as the, the ways into some of these problems that we've been talking about here. You know, what which ones are really worrying you? And and having heard what we just did, what, what do you think is a, the way to begin addressing some of these jointly? I think if you don't mind, I'd like to come to Anaba first. Uh, thank you, Laurie, and I hope you can hear me because I, uh, from time to time, I'm losing the uh, the sound at your end, but um, we can hear you. Uh, if, okay, perfect. First of all, happy New Year, and, uh, um, and 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 thank you for having me as part of this conversation for outlining a very uh, clear set of trends. Uh, as you said, these are not forecasts, but these are you know these are kind of uh, issues that we must be having a dialogue on. So, Laurie, your question is actually a very interesting one in terms of you know how do we uh, approach this if, if you take each of these as individual challenges um, then they inhabit their own different worlds there's an entire ecosystem of people 
dealing with technology and there's an ecosystem of people dealing with conditions and inflation and cost of living and there's a whole different world dealing with uh, you know the information age and then there is of course uh, the world of 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 uh, electoral democracies but uh, if if there is one common thing in all of this uh, to me it is a um, it is both a lack of uh, um, empathy or a lack of an idea of how do we and what do I mean by this? If you take each of these issues, a cost of living crisis, I want to start with that because at the end of the day, the bulk of the world's people um, live in the global south. Uh, they are impacted by food shocks, energy shocks, fuel shocks, finance shocks, uh, etc. cetera. Um, 100 million people and more have fallen below the poverty line just as a result uh, of the pandemic. Uh, to their lived reality. Before we think about what the macroeconomic central banker response ought to be, because often we just treat these as statistics, but we don't think of it as uh, what is their lived reality? What are the choices at the margin they are trying to make? Once we do that, then we get into this whole sense of what meaning is. The, the real meaning crisis is not alternative facts. The real meaning crisis, there is an entire swathe of human society. Our televisions uh, is not on our in our newspapers and that live reality can also be a good live. There could be innovation happening there. There could be sustainability happening on the ground, which we are not looking at, not supporting, even as we think of big infrastructure and big investment as the way to move towards sustainability. It is because of that lack of empathy where we also then don't understand the role of technology. So the role of technology is not just about, you know, whether we're going to lose and, uh, jobs or, 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 or retain jobs because of a shift towards fourth, for the fourth industrial revolution and artificial intelligence and so forth. The question is, who has agency? Does technology have agency or the technology innovators have agency or society has agency? It is our choice. Uh, to determine who has agency according to which we can then decide how technology responds to the needs of the vast majority of the world's population or not. And that is then where the legitimacy or lack thereof for democracy comes in. My worry about whatever happened in Brazil uh, or what happened in the United States is not, a, not about individual countries uh, it's, it's about this normalization of the attack on a smooth transfer of power. And that to me is worrying because then it could happen anywhere where things we have taken for granted, the smooth transfer of power in elected, electoral democracies comes into question. But at the base of it is this narrative that we are not being heard uh, or that the processes through which we have to be heard uh, are, are being questioned. So I would argue that the approach, the entry point here, the question, the mirror we have to be holding up of, in front of ourselves is, are we being empathetic enough to really understand these four mega trends you've identified? And does the increase or decrease of empathy give us a little bit more handle, control, agency over trying to find the intersections uh, across these trends and then focus on the technocratic or otherwise interventions and policy changes uh, and solutions that we might come up with. Thanks very much. Um, just before we move on, I wanted to remind everyone who's listening to this, please um, use the, the question and answer function. And if you've got any questions for any of our panelists, we'd love to have them. If you can start putting them in there now, we'll have time to get to them later on in the, uh, in the event. Aram, I wanted to ask you if you you just heard this. I mean, is is empathy really the problem? Like not not being able to put ourselves in in the shoes of people and see these all is real people just like us everywhere around the world that are facing these issues, especially as you're you're dealing with climate change and and this you know huge risk from that and efforts to drive dramatic change needed. 
Thank you very much, Laurie, and thanks to all for having me on the panel. Happy New Year again, again following Arunaba's example. Uh, listen, so for me, I think we need to shift the perspective a little bit. I think empathy is something maybe that we hear a lot as we're in the northern capitals. I'm usually in DC, and that's a word we often use. But if we flip the gaze and we're in the shoes of the farmer that's affected by climate change, the coastal person, I'm currently in Sinigat, looking at the coastline here, who's losing their home and their livelihood from climate change, I don't think empathy is the first thing that comes to mind. I think looking at each of the four really relevant trends that were introduced at the beginning of the panel, if you look at the democracy trend, indeed, the Sahel coups and instability were mentioned, but I, I'd like to emphasize more the, the rise in fragility and the rise in, uh, in vulnerability. Those are really the, determin the determining factors within which climate vulnerability and the livelihoods and the livelihood loss that uh, our vulnerable communities are feeling are playing against. And against that background, what I find is that it's not just um, uh, gloom and doom, so to say, but I see the, the trend being more of one where uh, people are more aware of the impacts of climate in their daily lives. Uh, in 2012, my PhD thesis focused on that. What will make people care about climate change in developing nations, including in African countries? And the answer of the thesis at the time was that it, we would just have to be hit more and more <laughs> by sea level rise, by, by rising climate related disasters. And I think today, 2022, as we start 2023, we are now approaching the eye of the cyclone more and more climate impacts are making landfall. And as communities are increasingly hit uh, across most of the developing country contexts that, that we operate in, what I find is that there's more awareness of the people impacted, that this is caused by global climate change. So there's more advocacy. We hear more voices coming from the global south asking for increased climate justice. So the democracy deficit is a, is a, is a general trend and a background against which we see more vulnerability and more fragility. But I also want to raise here the opportunity we see in having more climate advocates from the developing uh, country context saying this is global climate change, this is what it's doing to us, and this is what needs to, to happen. And I guess looping back to empathy, indeed that can create more empathy because I think the more we have victims uh, sharing their stories, uh, letting the world know what they're going through uh, as a result of climate change, uh, then we can indeed uh, achieve uh, global solidarity links, which are really essential for ensuring that we have put an end to this global climate crisis. I do want to share a few more thoughts, but Laurie, should I should I hold on on them for the next questions? Happy to pass on to other panelists. Thank you. <laughs> sure, let, let's move on, but but but, but please uh, do bring them up. I, uh, we'd love to hear. Um, <clears throat> Laurie, I'm I'm curious how you see these fitting together. You know, these are these are not all things that we normally think of as as hugely interrelated, but but you know, as we've just been hearing, they 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 really do matter to each other. And solving one in isolation is is probably not going to happen. How do you see this going ahead? Uh, thank you so much. Um, one of the most uh, obvious links is that uh, I think uh, we didn't mention or, or explore why we're having a cost of living crisis right now. And uh, the, the obvious cause of that is, uh, is Russia's uh, war of aggression against Ukraine and already before that Russia's weaponization of uh, fossil fuel supplies um, to Europe. Of course, uh, the, the war and, and Russia's aggression has also disrupted the supply of grain, supply of fertilizers and so on. But, but really at its core, this is a fossil fuel um, crisis and a fossil fuel um, crisis uh, precipitated by an authoritarian um, state. Um, so, uh, so that's uh, right at the core. Um, the, the positive thing um, is, is that uh, the response that we've seen to the, uh, to the rise in energy prices has been very much one that uh, that has further mainstreamed clean energy. Um, it's it's become clear that there are enough uh, decision makers um, who've internalized that uh, that uh, reducing economic reliance on fossil fuels, um, especially imported fossil fuels, um, is a key um, a part of uh, of economic 
success and uh, economic uh, resilience. Um, we've seen a, a very long list of, of uh, uh, policy programs, increased targets um, in Europe, in, in China. Um, the, the ambition on, on clean energy has increased along with, with the ambition on, on coal, but still it's a part of um, the response. Um, so, so um, and that's, that, that is a form of technological disruption. Um, I think you could say that uh, um, global climate policies is maybe under delivering, but uh, um, the clean energy technologies, the, the engineered solutions to the climate crisis and, and to emission reductions are delivering much more and much faster um, than, uh, than uh, I think anyone um, would have expected um, a few years ago. Um, so, uh, so that kind of mainstreaming of, of uh, clean energy is a, is a key part of this. And uh, also the mindset, mindset shift where, uh, where uh, uh, clean energy is, is more of an economic, um, uh, is a core part of economic policy, industrial policy, rather than relegated um, to um, climate policy. Um, so uh, um, those uh, realizing that those countries that are able to um, to uh, develop uh, um, vast amounts of, of clean energy will will attract uh, um, the manufacturing, the investments, um, the uh, um, economic uh, activity, um, the same way that uh, that uh, the uh, industrial economy of of uh, 100 years ago was formed around uh, coal deposits and uh, um, and uh, oil. Um, okay. The the flip. Uh, I'll say one more thing, which is that the flip side of that is is of course that uh, uh, that uh, there's a lot of resource nationalism. Um, China has has looked at uh, what happened uh, to Europe. And also what happened to Russia um, and uh, with with uh, the sanctions and, and this very barrier of, of uh, reliance on, on the international trade. Uh, the US obviously is uh, is working hard to reduce its its uh, reliance on um, on uh, uh, China for supply chains. Um, uh, Europe is, is uh, moving slower, but that's very much a much an issue. So this kind of resource uh, uh, nationalism, nationalism, both for better and and for worse, um, is a much bigger part of the picture, and maybe even um, moving away from the kind of globalization that uh, um, that uh, dominated the past couple of decades. Okay, thanks. So, so Manuel, if 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 the um... The technology for the energy transition is coming and there, as we've, as we've heard, why is it emissions are still rising and we're still so worried? And, and, and we see these, you know, we see the fragility and the vulnerability that Aram was talking about everywhere. I mean, not least in Pakistan uh, this last year, but, but in, you know, in many places around the globe, what's happening in Somalia and so on. How, how do we push forward through, through all these things to, you know, to, begin to achieve this. Uh, thank you, Lori. Uh, look, by keeping the long term vision, the description of the current reality, the four topics that we are uh, currently discussing are fully true. A bit sad, but that is a reality of the world. But in some way, there is an exception when we think about climate, because something that we haven't yet appreciated well, it is that we've been able to define clearly a collective objective for the planet. The idea of the 1.5, the net zero and the resilient world, it is in my point of view for the first time ever that we have agreed in something in which nobody is doubting. And that is fantastic for the world because that means that all of our actions with all the difficulties that we are facing, with all the obstacles, with all the limits that the lack of democracy or, or, or the inequities could bring to the process, no, are continue being or will continue being derived by the idea of the long term vision. So what we do need it is to recognize that this climate debate 
it's still, despite of that we are not yet on track, a good model on how to address the current difficulties of the world. By keeping the long-term vision, by being clear that we shouldn't raise temperature in more than 1.5, that we have to halve emissions in this decisive decade, are, is, are, are good ways to address the current difficulties of the world. But let me add something else. When we think in the climate debate, probably it is, and I am referring to the climate debate and not to the current status of the climate, I am referring to the full climate debate and to the objective of the Paris Agreement and to the objective of the Glasgow Pact. So when we think about of that climate debate, it is clear that it is an inclusive one. The level of participation of different actors within the world, including the youth, including the activists, it is fantastic. And how multidisciplinary the climate debate it is, it is part of those issues that we have to continue exploiting in a proactive way as a positive way also to address the current reality of the world. Also, what it is important in relation to technology, Laurie, it is in the climate debate there is a key principle that sometimes we are used to forgetting, that it is don't leave anyone behind. And that is a key one because when we think about of how much technology it is evolving to address emissions or to address the systemic transformation in the four economic sectors that science are suggesting, we do know that that technology, it should promote equity within the world, within the planet. And that is something in which we have to work on. Yesterday, somebody asked me, what do you think, Manuel, about the nuclear energy as a source of energy to address uh, emission reduction? And one of my point, it was currently, there are just 31 countries around the world with nuclear facilities, 31. That means 31 of 200 countries of the world. The point it is how affordable and how feasible for the developing world it is to deploy energy facilities without the resources, without probably the skills to do that. The point it is that the proposed technology must fit with the don't leave anyone behind principle of the climate debate because that is also one of the objectives of the debate. And also some virtually in relation to what it is happening in the climate debate, it is the role of science. Probably in the climate debate, it is the first time ever in which in some way, probably I am too optimistic and I could sound a bit naive, but yeah, I am optimistic by nature, but it is probably the first time ever in which we are following what science is suggesting when we think about the energy transition, the industry, the cities and infrastructure and the land use, deforestation and agriculture. That is something that it was proposed by the IPCC, so proposed by science. The 1.5, it was defined not by the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement referred to well below two degrees, but we are following the 1.5 as the threshold for the climate debate. So by following science, also we can sort the difficulties that misinformation it is creating in relation to democracy, in relation to social and political processes. So there are many elements in the climate debate that can help us to continue following and achieving our objective. Let, let me finish this intervention by reminding what former President Hollande mentioned just a year after the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement, it is an irreversible and unstoppable process. Yeah, yeah remember what happened uh, in the US some a, a year after the Paris Agreement when former President Trump decided to, uh, to, 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 to decline, to, I, 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 I forget the, the, the name, but, but to, 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 to go out from the Paris Agreement. And a group of non-state actors through what it was called we are still in, decided to keep the process alive. And now the US, it is back in the process. Sorry, let me finish with this. Also, we have to appreciate that even in time of inflation, what happened in the US in August of 2022 with the Inflation Reduction Act, it is a good example on how well a political signal could be sent. Because if you haven't read the Inflation Reduction Act, Act do it. Because it is not an economic law, it is a climate law. It is a law that it is promoting energy efficiency, that it is promoting renewable, that it is promoting even 
uh, equity and, and inclusion in the poorest areas of the uh, of the U.S. territory. So there are good examples on how much and how well the climate debate could help us to address the current difficulties of the planet and also to continue improving our actions towards a strong emission reduction time. Yeah, I think that the, um, the this issue of the um, the political signals is is absolutely crucial, right? In all of this, we see that when the when you set out the the where we're headed, it's a lot easier for everyone to get there. I know I live in the UK, and and the fact that we've been investing in offshore wind for a while, and it's now you know actually providing quite a bit of the the power here, is is been a fantastic thing through this Russia crisis and the energy crisis, and th I think the the sort of clear signal ahead helps. Now you know whether that signal is still quite so clear. I'm not sure there's a lot of issues in, in many countries around the world because of the conflict. I also thought it's interesting what you say about the, you know, the long term vision is so, so important, but we also have short time frames and that, you know, if we're going to try to hold to 1.5, we have seven years. I'm, you know, it, it, it's not very long. And so that, that's where I think things like nuclear are quite an interesting discussion, right? Because it, it is low low carbon, but it takes often a very long time to get it in place and up and running. And if we get clean energy in place after we've already passed irreversible tipping points in the climate system, you know, it may not work quite so well. So it seems that, that solar and wind and things like that are probably faster at any rate. Also, I wanted to turn to you because I think democracy, you know, we haven't really talked enough about this issue of threats to democracy and the closing democratic space to try to address some of this. And I, I'm really curious what you think about that. You know, I, I think these figures about how much democracy is contracting are, are phenomenal and not something that everyone's aware of. How is that affecting all of this in this effort to deal with these problems? Thank you so much, Laurie, and, and Happy New Year to everyone. Really wonderful to listen to all the experts uh, joining us on this call. So going back to your original question, Laurie, you know, what keeps you up at night? <laughs> I will say that it was reading about the democracy that really was a, you know, we have of course heard this many times, but seeing the numbers was quite eye opening. Um, how we are kind of reversing back, you know, uh, now at the level of democracy worldwide, uh, that we saw 30 years ago, basically. So I think, I mean, looking at, at the currents together, we know that economic, um, uh, yeah, the economy moves in cycles, um, business cycles. Uh, hopefully we can see a greener uh, recovery if and how we enter this, you know, recession that we're now fearing. Technology, uh, we have seen multiple technology revolutions in the past. There are ways of managing technology, even though it often, uh, you know, very unfortunately end up in furthering divides or gaps. But coming back to democracy, it is indeed concerning, you know, what is the historical precedent there in terms of, you know, how do we deal with uh, a backlash on democracy? But I think trying to relate this trend to the sustainability agenda that we all, you know, work for, I, I see three important issues or things that I would look out for now in the year ahead. One is, you know, as we now uh, formulate and implement climate policy, how do we build strong institutions and how do we make sure to have a good division of power uh, between institutions uh, so we don't fall into that trap of, of you know, uh, climate policy being weaponized for uh, autocratic leaders, for example. A second uh, really key thing I think is education and training, and this is of course also addressing that meaning crisis, uh, misinformation, uh, and, and the third, uh, I think the uh, question on everyone's mind is, you know, the speed of the climate transition. Now that we have the long-term target in place, I mean, compared to 10 years ago, I think we have a much bigger agreement globally and across sectors, finance, business, government, that we need to make this huge climate transition. But how do we implement it and how do we really translate this into action on the ground? Um, we already know that the legislative process takes time and, you know, for good democratic reasons. But are there any innovations that can speed up that process? Um, I think we heard a lot about innovations, for example, e 
e-government, you know, how can we use the digital revolution to uh, enhance uh, the process of governing? It's been a bit quiet, you know, what can we, uh, is there any innovation to do in that regard? Um, so legislation takes time, permitting takes time, bureaucracy takes time. But I was, I have to say, a bit uh, concerned when I heard recently that uh, the Global Methane Pledge, I was indeed one of the successes coming out of Glasgow with a very broad uh, support from countries and seemingly quite, you know, low hanging fruits, uh, very cost effective uh, actions you could take. That is also, you know, stalling and it's actually not yet for these bureaucratic reasons, but just, you know, dispersing money. Uh, donors have already decided to fund this, but it takes time to, to get the money on the ground. So I think that sort of insight of, you know, how can we really speed up decision making in a way that, you know, um, does not threat uh, democracy in a fundamental way. I think there will be trade offs, but th that is really the key questions. And I really hope we can see some, you know, concrete uh, innovations uh, and actions to take inspiration from. Thanks. I, I think that is really a, a crucial question. How do you speed up what needs to happen really fast um, in within a democratic system that genuinely consults the people that need to be consulted so you end up with the right answers? Um, I wanted to turn to Shauna. You know, we've been talking about, um, I think we have something like 90% of the world's emissions right now that are under um, net zero pledges. And you know, so we should be well on our way, right, to to solving this climate crisis. But at the same time, we see emissions going up every year. So, you know, part of it is is how do you achieve these these things? How do how do you hold um, corporates to account on on what are normally you know voluntary pledges? How how do you see that working? What's the role of corporates not not only on climate change but on some of these other issues around you know information disinformation and so on? Yeah, um, I think that's a really, really valid point. You're completely right. There's a huge amount of our emissions are conceivably under targets and they're under plans. I think it's uh, pretty much most of the FTSE have a have some sort of net zero target in place now. So in theory, we should be in a really good spot. Um, but at the same time, you've seen a lot of questioning, greenwashing, whatever you want to call it, of whether this is just a little bit of chat and not a lot of action. And I think that's probably why you've seen greater um, focus on financial disclosures and trying to put rigor around what is conceivably quite an unwieldy system. I think the thing that we are seeing from corporates is we've seen a huge acceleration in the last 10 years in terms of moving from just putting windmills on the tops of brochures and trying to kind of make things look a little bit green to actually putting action into place. And those that are leading are the ones that are really delivering and provably delivering on those net zero or other targets that they have for 2030 or 2050, depending where they are in this space. I think there is a role for those guys to continue to strive forwards and, and show that they are leading the way and delivering it, not least because a lot of what we've seen in terms of where public trust is, is often actually in the brands that they find in their store cupboard rather than the skepticism that they often see in terms of government delivery etc so i think there's a huge role there that said to rely on business alone is for the birds they can control their scope one and scope two and i think we're seeing good progress on there and certainly amongst those that are leading we'll continue to see it but if we're really going to make a tangible move to really reducing emissions or creating greater resilience in our frankly wider planetary system there is going to have to be a lot more kind of public private partnerships we've got to bring along society with us and there's got to be much more collaboration i think if there's one thing that we saw from the pandemic and i know that's been raised is we can do absolutely incredible things when those institutions those businesses and governments come together in terms of rapid delivery it wasn't seamless and it wasn't flawless but it, there was an amazing amazing shift that took place there if you can apply that kind of effort focus and transition into something like we're talking about now in terms of climate you will not only see I think we will see some incredible changes in terms of technology. We'll see some, hopefully, things in terms of both mitigation, but also adaption, which I think will come on to, and I'm sure we'll talk about in a little bit. 
But we will also see some of the other challenges that we've kind of raised in these currents addressed across the kind of democratic principles, across how we're kind of managing our supply chains, across how we are um, ensuring that the information out there is factual and we're still placing um, an emphasis on science and truth. Um, so I think huge, huge role to play, but it certainly can't be done in isolation. Right, thank you. I think that this issue of bringing society along, that's really crucial, isn't it? And almost all of what we're talking about here. And and Aram, I wanted to get, just go back to you because I know you still had some things to say on that. And that was essentially what you were talking about too, right? That you, we, we actually have to help people understand that these that these are problems that they you know there are ways to to deal with them and we need to really figure out answers that are going to work for for everybody not not something that's imposed from somewhere that doesn't recognize the local reality no i, I fully agree on that Murray. and the good news is that whether you are with farmers in Tanzania or in Madagascar, people know about climate change. We're not in the scenario we were in 20 years ago when it was this still new phenomenon. So I think in terms of misinformation on the ground, I do not find any misinformation. I think people are actually overly informed about climate and what it does and why these changes that they experience on a daily basis, whether it's change in weather patterns or these, those, these extraordinary climate disasters that are hitting with more frequency and with more severity. I think people are very informed on the ground. And I think also that's an opportunity going forward because you don't have to introduce what climate change is as you go into these communities and into, into countries to try to effect change and, and, and ensure that policy changes are in place to deal with these disasters. I also find in my work in the bank that it's a, it's a, it's a safe topic. It's difficult to convince a prime minister or president to discuss, you know, political strife and and civil, but it's easy to talk about climate change because it's externally caused with local impact. So that's I always find it's an easy programming topic in our political dialogue. And as we discuss with clients what to do, what with client countries, what to do with going going next. What I do find an opportunity in is the both. I think it's both sides when it comes to the tech revolution. I want to spend a minute on that if you allow me, Laurie. Because I think indeed the you know the green hydrogen discussions that we had not over a month ago in, in, in Angola. So those are, are exciting for both the private investors, the private sector and the public uh, sectors folks. So they're good, but I also don't want us to think that it'll be the silver bullet. I think many other panelists raised this. We cannot uh, cheat ourselves out of the behavioral changes which are essential for us to stop the climate crisis. Uh, our friends in Florida will have to put, on, put off those lights that are on 24-7. We will need to drive smaller cars. We will have to bike. We will need to, to leapfrog back to, to, to those technologies that are, that are, I guess, also important that everyone can use across the globe, whether in the Netherlands or in southern Senegal in Casamance, you know, people just have to go back to biking and that's more of a path to sustainability. But I do realize that the behavioral changes we're asking for in our climate community, in our side of the of the debate, are, are, are still anathema and still uh, unthought of for many people on the other side of the discussion. So that's more what I see as, as, the, as the trend and the, the tensions we will still have to struggle with as we look at 2023 and, uh, and beyond uh, through 2030. How do we ensure that we don't just focus on technological breakthroughs, but we really do the groundwork, the needed essential day-to-day uh, -day, uh, work of convincing humanity that there's no planet B. And we've got to put in the work to make sure that we keep the planet that we have today. Back to you, Laurie, and thank you. Yeah, thanks. So, so how how do we persuade people that we need to do this? I mean, it, it, because it's really you're right; it's really happening at all levels. I mean, we need politicians setting, you know, where, the, where we're going, and and international groups and business, you know, knowing where we're going. And we need people recognizing that the lifestyle that they still see on TV is not necessarily the one that we all ought to be adopting. And in fact, all of us ought to be um, taking some responsibility and shifting towards something that is is more sustainable. But we're trying to do that at a time where like fundamental questions about what's reality and what's the truth and 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 you know all of that is is up in the air um i'm just curious anybody it, what what do you think is 
you know, the way to to attack this on all these levels. Yes, Anurama. Uh, uh, I, I want to just pick up where uh, Aram left off mm. on this behavioral change issue, because you're right, you know, if you just leave it to uh, individuals, even though it is about individual behavior, if you leave it to individuals, you're not, you don't get the consistency of action at scale that then makes the behavioral change uh, story something that becomes one more wedge in your wedges of climate action. Um, so uh, uh, just a few months ago uh, uh, in India, we launched formally what something called Mission Life, Lifestyle for Environment, something that the Prime Minister talked about first in Glasgow, but then it, uh, another 11 months later, we had the formal mission in place. Um, we at CW had some role to play in that. Uh, and the UN Secretary General was also present when this uh, mission was launched. Now, if you think about how we try to attack this, there is, of course, the nudging of individual behavior, but there is also the second pillar of what we call the enabling of markets to respond to that change in individual behavioral, uh, kind of the demand for more sustainable products. And there is a third part, which is both the shift in policy, but also the shift in aspirations. So it like goes back to you know, what is a good life? But before we get into that philosophical world of what is the good life and what is an aspirational uh, life that is considered to be pro considered to be progress and yet not consuming more and more of planetary resources, the nudging of uh, behavior and the enabling of markets can actually give you very concrete things to do. So one of the things we're doing is again, just how do we count GDP? Um, and we've come GDP by, I mean, if you're an economist, you've been taught, you know, you've come how much is consumption expenditure, how much is investment expenditure, how much is government procurement expenditure, and how much is net exports. That's how you get a calculation of GDP. Now, what if we did the same equation, but we're looking at how much of that consumption expenditure is actually the sustainable consumption expenditure? How much of investment, uh, capital investment, is going into the circular economy. How much of government procurement is going towards procuring lesser resource intensive products and services? How much of net exports is actually about exporting less resource intensive? Um, when you start doing that, that individual nudging of behavior suddenly spans into something that becomes a market of hundreds of billions of dollars as we are calculating. So I think it's very important to take what Aram is saying about, you know, this, this is not going to be done by a a hubristic technological fix alone, but then truly supporting that behavioral story with a larger narrative about a shift towards the way the macroeconomy is considered. Yeah, Manuel, I think you had something to say about this as well. Yes, Laurie, this is a really fantastic discussion because you are asking what, what to do. When I read the concept for today's event, a phrase popped up in my mind, people lose trust on leaders. And that is an important phrase, but I would like to do the opposite, that it is, what does it mean to be a leader today? Because probably we are suffering of lack of a new kind of leadership for the world. Let me use this example. Who has just been defined the person of the year by time? Zelensky, no, I think so. I, I hope that I am not wrong. Why? No, we are talking about somebody in charge of leading a war. No, because he has a clear vision. He knows what to do, that it is to recover territory. Unfortunately, we're in the middle of the war, and sorry for using this example, but it is an important one. He has measurable actions that for me it is key, so he can show progress to his people and to the world. No, I have recovered this side of the territory of this other side of the territory, or I have captured X, Y, Z. So clarity in the, in, in the vision, measurable actions. He has defined, organized systems and tools so the people can follow him. And that is for me, it is not that I am suggesting to, to put all the work into a war, but sometimes we have to think based in this idea of the urgency 
during times of war. Because we are, in some way, when we think about climate and nature loss, we are fighting a war. But probably we are not full, fully conscious of that. So what is happening? That the case of Zelensky it is clear. And, and, and you can put all those elements and you can confirm that he's a good leader you know, based on that situation. But probably the current leaders are not including those elements. And, and, and let, let, let me mention something about uh, something that Shonate, you mentioned, a speed. So what I'm trying to say it is that what we used to have as a speed of leaders is not operating more now. That's the point. So, so and that is why we are suffering all these difficulties with democracy, with democracy, because probably by now the people is expecting to have a leader that can communicate as a tweet, something pragmatic, something quick, but something that it is measurable. And that is something that we have to explore. What are the new elements of leadership for the world? No, so some reflections, probably not clear answers, but Zelensky it is a good example on why the people is following him, why it is in the front page of the Time magazine. Yeah, that, I mean, that's absolutely fascinating, honestly. <laughs> you have a leader who's got a clear vision, who steps up in a time of need, who can behave in a selfless way and can tell a coherent story that moves people. You know, that's really something. And I mean, I would point out that Donald Trump is one of the people who has moved people through a tweet and things like this. So, you know, it's 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 not all uh, it's not all a clear trajectory here, but but I think you're absolutely right. You know, the the leadership needs to be different for this new era of different kinds of, of threats. Asa, you were keen to jump in here. And then I'll yes. get to the Ushani. Uh I just wanted to to compliment a little bit what uh, what Arunaba raised about uh, sustainable lifestyles. But first, I think also you know the the uh, leadership is so important. I fully agree with that, and I think agency is really a key word. I hope to to see and hear in uh, 2023. Um, from urgency to agency, um, we've been talking about you know this turbulent world, uh, changing geopolitics for quite some time. But you know how do we translate that into agency? But um, I think you know how how to get people with you. One one sort of uh, thing I would think would be exciting to maybe see in this this year is um, green jobs and. Um, I believe there are now more people working in the clean energy industry than in the fossil industry. The IEA has done reports on this, but we haven't really. I think the clean energy narrative is still very driven by the finance sector, you know, making investments, rolling it out. But actually, the people working and being, you know, dependent on this industry, and also, of course, you know, want to develop it further and take pride in their jobs. I think that that. Uh, you know, could be a really compelling reason for people to support the climate transition when they see that it translates directly into jobs. But uh, when it comes to sustainable lifestyles, I, I fully agree that, you know, it's very much actually not about individuals taking action, but society making it uh, possible to to have a sustainable lifestyle. But there is some really interesting research, I think, in people's motivation. So going back to that individual level, uh, in, in Finland, I know, maybe Laurie knows more about this. There has been research on, you know, what motivates people to adopt sustainable lifestyles. And actually, sustainability is a very small part of it. Uh, you know, like uh, concern for the environment or, you know, some some maybe even connecting it to climate targets. Um, what's really important also is a thriftiness. So, I mean, saving money. Uh, maybe more common with our grandparents generation but you know maybe cost of living is kind of bumping that motivation up a little bit uh some people are mo motivated by the you know being in the technology forefront using new smart gadgets here in sweden now people are using these energy efficiency uh, innovations in their houses to, to really monitor you know, down to hours and minutes when they how they should optimize their energy use. So I think if we could government research business could really tap into these motivation profiles. And if we're lucky, some of the crisis we're talking about today could really kind of boost uh, motivation, not just from the sustainability angle, but also these other angles, which I think are very uh, 
compelling and important in our daily lives. Yeah, mot <coughs> motivation is really important because, you know, we know that none of us are very good at doing things we're not at all excited about or don't feel are that interesting. And if you if you can really find ways to, to drive this behavior around what people are excited about, to make the things that we want to have happen um, exciting and aspirational and being part of a group of people doing it, then it, it changes everything, I think. Shana. It's actually a very short point related to that. I think we talk a lot and often within the same circles about the same problems and how those are progressing. But when you start to put them in the outside world, our research has shown that, and I'm sure there's lots of other research has shown the same, is there's two things amongst kind of most people in terms of one, they don't understand what most of these terms mean. Net zero means something to us. Great. But actually, like what tangibly, what does that mean to most people in most countries? But equally, there is a kind of desire to see some form of change. And so the appetite is there. They just don't want to hear it alongside cost of living, energy. Like the world is pretty rubbish, right? has been for some people for many, many years, but right now particularly, there's lots of challenges. So how we communicate right now is incredibly important. And I think there needs to be a greater emphasis on doing it in terms that change by culture and by market, but are clear and simple and actionable. And I think that's where the Zelensky comparison is and the Trump comparisons actually are quite very useful. These people know how to communicate fundamentally, and they know how to communicate on really complex topics in incredibly simple ways that are motivating um, and I think the other thing that we have seen recently that's worth thinking about is people aren't against any of this stuff but they just want to see practical solutions and policies got underway and so to the society point like I think exactly what Anza said like people are a sort of moving in that direction anyway the majority of there's always a, a section that will not but they also just need people to like business government institutions to get on with it and then we will start to kind of see some positive dividend, I think, in terms of behavior as well. Great. Lowry, I didn't I don't want to leave you out here. Did, 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 what do you think about all this motivation? Is this the way forward or is it something else? Uh, thank you, sir. I, I think uh, I also have a pretty basic distinction to make, which is it's if you, if what you're trying to do is you're trying to tell people, here's why you should care about my issue. That's really hard. People aren't looking for new issues to worry about and care about. So if you're able to say not that, but say this is what I can do about the issues that you care about, you're much more likely to make headway. And I, I think Manuel's example of the Inflation Reduction Act is, is a very good one. I don't, I don't think it's a climate bill. It's an economic bill, but it's an economic bill that takes a lot of steps in terms of reducing emissions because those, uh, um, you know, as I said, the, the inflation crisis is to a large extent a fossil fuel crisis and and the thing that we need to do to address it is to reduce reliance on fossil fuels similarly you know the reason why uh, china's gone for a massive increase in ambition with clean energy a part of that is about climate leadership but a big part of that is about uh, industrial policy about energy security and and so on so it's uh positioning those climate solutions to to uh um, address um, uh, things that are um, that are happening in the world and that, that are that are the burning um, issues right now. Um, another example, um, my organization, Center for Research on Energy and Clean Air, we were started to um, to shed light on on uh, the health impacts of uh, fossil fuels. Um, so a lot of what we've been doing is is uh, uh, assess assessments of the air quality impacts, the health impacts of uh, fossil fuel projects, of uh, clean energy policies and so on, to show um, how clean energy solutions can address that problem that that uh, a lot of people very viscerally and, and uh, personally care about in different parts of the world. So um, so there's just a lot of uh, this work to be done around different uh, issues. OK, fantastic. I can see, you know, we're getting sh short on time here and I, there's so much to talk about. We could be here a long time longer, but I, I really did want to get to some of the questions that are in the, the Q&A because I think people have got, I'm not the only one who's got questions on this. Uh, let me just see if I can see here. Um, here's one. 
Do you think it's possible to create a truly sustainable world in our current capitalist system? If so, how? Or do you think large systemic changes are needed? And if so, where do we start? I'd love to have at least one person <laughs> see if I can take that on. Any any uh, any takers? Otherwise, you can think about it, and I'll go on to the next one. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just, uh, go ahead. Okay. Let me say something, Laura, in relation to that. I think it is possible if we are able to connect our vision with the economic processes. And look, we are entering, the current times means that we are entering into a new, in my point of view, climate economy. Probably we are just in the first steps, but clearly the world it is coming into including more climate consideration for the economic process and for for development, for development objective. And, and, and that is fantastic. It is not happening the same with nature. It is interesting that the difference in between the climate debate and the biodiversity or nature debate, it is the lack of understanding on how much nature loss it must be connected to the economy. So I think that if we are able to continue connecting the economy processes with the climate objective, that means, on the other hand, to include all the actors to work the transitions and, and, and to define a clear and systemic understanding of, for example, what does it mean net zero? We haven't finished yet in defining what does it mean net zero? What is that balance in between emissions reductions and removal? We do need to clarify that. And, and let me finish by saying we do need to align our language. Fully agree with you, Laurie. The point it is that each one of the actors, it is speaking with their own language and it is not understanding the other. But yeah, I think it is possible. Okay. Uh, anybody else quickly want to jump in on that, or should we move to the next one? Just stick up your hand if you're interested. Okay. Well, let me go to the next. Um, we have one here saying that it's really helpful that many people worldwide now know about climate change and the link to fossil fuels, but there's a risk, as with any issue, that it's seen too simplistically. For example, unsustainable food production and consumption practices contribute hugely to climate change and biodiversity loss, pollution, and other things. But I don't think nearly as many people are aware of their impact on climate through their food consumption as through their heating, lighting, transport. You know, what, what's the need for, for real public education on, on what are the important things we should be thinking about as we try to do behavior change? Anybody like to answer that? Um, I'll, I'll just yes. say one thing as a, as a long time vegan myself, um, I feel like probably a part of it is that uh, uh, that uh, the food debate has been um, monopolized by, by people with a with, with a very principled stance of uh, of uh, being vegan, not eating meat rather than um, a much um, uh, easier um, transition to to eating more sustainable mixed uh, food and and uh, one thing that I've certainly seen in in uh, many parts of, of Europe at least uh, changing this is is the new uh, meat substitution products or um, or vegetable uh, protein products which are just you know they're just good food suitable for a lot of the cooking that people do healthier than um, then uh, the meat uh, that you would use other for otherwise and so on. So it's another um, solution that just by making making it easier um, uh, can uh, can shift things. Um, and and uh, the other thing is uh, we do have to think about a lot of different uh, shifts and solutions at the same time. Um, uh, uh, Laurie said uh, um, in the beginning that uh, pointed out that we have a lot to do before by 2030, and uh, on that time scale, it makes sense to focus on some of those big things, uh, reducing coal, um, electricity, but but getting to actual zero emissions just means tackling a lot of harder problems, including um, agriculture, inc including steel production and everything um, in between. And uh, simply because of the fact that I, I don't think people are going to change how they eat and what they eat solely because of climate it's just um, a whole different track of uh, of finding the reasons and the motivations and, and communicating the, the reasons um, for people to eat uh, uh, more sustainably and healthier 
Thank you. OK, here's an interesting one. What are the prospects for agreement on fossil fuel phase out at COP28? Is there a role for the G20? I mean, this is an interesting meeting, you know, to try to have fossil fuel phase out while you're meeting in, in Dubai is is a is a big ask, right? You know, we haven't we haven't seen a lot of that driving huge ambition in the past. Uh, what, what do you think? Anybody want to tackle that one? If not, I have one more for you too. Uh, it's probably the last one we can get to in the time we've got. How does the challenge of tackling biodiversity loss fit and interact with these four currents? If anybody wants to take on either of those, stick up your hand. Yeah, Manuel. Okay, let me go to the first, the phase out of fossil fuels. Yeah, we hope that we can get an agreement that in some way it has been postponed from COP27. We know how weak COP27 was, so we are pushing to have a good uh, decision in relation to, uh, 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 sorry, in COP28. Also remind that this idea of being clear on phasing out fossil fuels started in COP26 in Glasgow, when the agreement, it was to phase out coal, but unfortunately in the last minutes and because of India among some other countries, the phrase was changed to phase down, no? But the point it is that now COPs st still are the most important political piece of the climate debate, but not the single one. And that is interesting. So there are some processes that are unstoppable. The phase out of coal, it is unstoppable, despite of how much willingness parties could have in defining a clear agreement in COPs. So the point it is that we do need to work to have that agreement, to have that political signal, but also to use some alternative mechanism as the financial mechanism to avoid to continue supporting or investing in, the, in those fossil fuels, because this will be a gradual process. So my point it is, I am pretty sure that we can get something, probably not as much as we are expecting, but we have to continue working outside COP's world to continue pushing to produce that fossil fuel. And yeah, I, 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 I will leave the biodiversity loss to, to give the opportunity to some other. Okay. Arunava, were you looking to talk about biodiversity loss or fossil fuels? Well, I want to talk about all three a little bit, the, the food question, uh, the fossil fuel question and, and biodiversity. Uh, with just one uh, word, voice. You know, uh, when Albert Hirschman wrote Exit Voice Loyalty more than 50 years ago, uh, the argument was simple. Uh, you stick with a process you consider legitimate if you have voice in it. And if you don't see the outcomes that, that are responding to your needs, you exit it. Now, if you take all of these questions, they are from a planetary perspective, extremely important questions. The role of fossil fuels and energy systems, the kind of food we grow and eat, uh, and of course, where does biodiversity fit in, uh, especially in the context of a species that is uh, dominating the planet, but also in a parasitic way. The, the report that Osha and I uh, lead authored uh, for Stockholm Plus 50, the first recommendation was changing humans' relationship with nature. Now, why do I say voice? Because it is not, uh, and I might be a little heretical here, but it is not actually about the food we eat. It is actually about the role of nutrition in human development. Uh, if you don't focus on human development, then we only have this one or zero approach towards meat or no meat or uh, some, uh, you know, veggies or vegan, etc. Right. And this goes back to the point about uh, empathy and apathy. So there will be communities where for nutritional reasons you might be consuming meat, but that is not the community that is consuming meat for, you know, a night out and a date. You know, so there's a difference between what you consume and who consumes and for what purpose. The same applies to the use of fossil fuels in our energy systems. Yes, there was a resistance towards the phase out of coal, even though India has already demonstrated it is the world's fourth largest renewable energy market already, much earlier at a stage of development than other economies, and the third most attractive uh, renewables investment destination, and just last week has announced the world's largest program on green hydrogen. But India's proposal for phasing out all fossil fuels was rejected in COP27. Right? 
So again, the question is not about fossil fuels or not fossil fuels. It's about who needs it for a particular purpose and who does who is using it for lifestyle purposes. And that the last voice that is not there is about all the non-human species on the planet. Yeah. And this but, lack of convergence for 30 years of the Rio, Con Rio conventions is a challenge because we are back to what Aram was saying. We are a hubristic species that thinks we can spoil things and then have technological fixes to it. <laughs> so the point here is I, I, I don't disagree with the question about this uh, getting away from fossil fuels. I don't disagree with the question about uh, the, 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 whether we eat meat or not. And I don't disagree with the question about uh, 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 biodiversity, but what is missing is the voice of the voiceless, the humans and the non-humans. And if we don't get that right, we will not be able to demonstrate that COP28 or any other COP is going to do, demonstrate anything different from what we've experienced the last 30 years. Yeah, that's important. Aram, do you want to come in on that? I wanted to come in on the biodiversity question a yes. little bit. I'm really glad that the person raised it. I know Laurie will come in in a minute as well. But I think it's important we see them as we look at trends 2023 onwards as really the same, the same challenge. We cannot solve the climate crisis if we are depleting our biodiversity. We, we cannot achieve uh, climate resilience if we're not building with nature. I think our colleagues now worldwide have made the case so strongly that I really wish that COP15 and COP27 were really one event, so to say, in the past year. And hopefully going forward, as we look at COP28 and the future biodiversity COPs, the world will find ways and segues to bring the two conversations into one large space, because they're, they're really one of the one, two sides of the same question. How do we save the planet? And that cannot happen if we do not work with the biodiversity that we've been, we've, we've been God given. So that was on that question. I just wanted to comment quickly on the first question, which made me smile. I think we don't have a, we don't have a, an option if we're not optimistic and if we don't make these these dire changes needed then there's just no planet b again so i think we've got to come up and we're a smart species we've got to come up with ways to ensure our own sustainability on this planet we've got to find ways to tell ourselves you know this is all the destruction that's taken place we now need to just enter a new era where our children and their children function and operate differently with the resources that we have. And then the victims are already here sharing the stories of what happens if we don't. So back to you, Lowry, Laurie. Thanks. Thank you. Lowry, just just very briefly, we're running very short on time. I want to get to one last thing. Definitely. I just wanted to uh, flag the uh, bioenergy, biofuels aspect of this. So obviously the, the sky high prices of fossil fuels have, have uh, meant that uh, there's uh, even more demand for uh, for burning um, bioenergy and biofuels, which has which is making the the um, biodiversity crisis um, worse. Um, so one thing that we really uh, clearly um, need uh, need to um, need articulated is is uh, um, the need to prioritize uh, um, true uh, clean energy that is isn't based on um, on uh, grabbing food. Um, from people and putting it, putting it into the tank or or cutting down forests uh, um, for energy and uh, uh, failure to step back on or cut down on on biofuel use when we were going through and are still going through this um, uh, food crisis globally is, is one of the big uh, failures of, of global um, solidarity and, and governance. So um, just wanted to throw that in. Well, we we have talked about so many interesting things here and and, and so many interesting uh, things tied together. You know, what is a good life? Well, what does it mean to be a, a leader today? We're all fighting a war. It's not just Zelensky, but how do we learn to communicate like him to get people on our side and and have this success? You know, and how do we how do we talk to people about their issues and not our issues in order to drive this all forward? I want to just super briefly, and I mean like 15 seconds, each of you, can you point to one thing that's coming up in this coming year that you think is a, a positive development or something that, that could help or an opportunity? Um, I'm going to start with uh, Sean. With me? Um, yes. 
I think we are going to start to see from the corporate perspective delivery on all of this chat and goals that have been taking place. I know from my work that there are several things coming and the more momentum we have behind that, um, at least from one side, the better. Awesome. So I look forward to India championing sustainable lifestyles uh, to climate vulnerable people, hopefully making you know uh, progress on the loss and damage uh, agenda. EU uh, agreeing on the Fit for 55 now during the Swedish presidency, but also very uh, hopefully um, the citizens of Europe, uh, you know, the energy savings that we can collectively make will, you know, bring a powerful message of solidarity also in the face of the Ukraine war. Manuel. Clarity on the vision. I will insist on that. And I think the climate debate, it is telling us how important it is to know where to go, how to go, and what to achieve. Arunaba. Uh, I am actually excited about the potential of jobs, growth, and sustainability all coming together. And the livelihoods perspective, the livelihoods lens, will actually give us that political demand for sustainability from the people who are most impacted. And that's where a lot of the innovation is already happening. Lowry. Um, the uh, massive scale up of uh, uh, clean energy um, solutions that started with with uh, the fossil fuel crisis really coming to fruition investment in in uh, manufacturing investment in de deployment uh, um, starting to uh, bend the emission curve um, is is uh, I think going to be the big story on e emissions and energy this year. Aram. My colleagues, I think, have covered it all. I agree with all of them and the ones that raised it. Maybe if I could add one, it would be the IPCC definition of climate resilient development. I think that's a really nice umbrella. And as we focus mitigation and adaptation actions and investments at country level, that'll be uh, a, a nice shift. So we stop talking about mitigation and adaptation separately and have one focused climate agenda at national level. Thank you. And thanks to all of you. That was so interesting. I really appreciate it being a, a good conversation amongst all of us. And I wanted to hand over now. We're, we're hoping to see a video that we wanted to show you at the beginning, but we uh, now we'll try to show it to you at the end here. Um, can I hand over to have that introduced? Uh, thank you. Can you see me? Um, Mons uh, here again, and uh, before we start the keynote speech, which has been recorded for technical reasons, I want to throw in my own little positive note uh, to end with. Um, you know, we've had like seven bad years of uh, global deteriorating international relations. Uh, with I think we had a good year in 2015 with the SDGs and the Paris Agreement, but it's been downhill since then in the international relations. I think there's an undercurrent of optimism uh, that things are coming together. I think a lot of big parts of the world are realizing what we might be missing. And I see I see a lot of signs of this already in 22, uh, you know, from the midterm election in the United States to the gelling together of the EU in the face of the Russian aggression the uprising in Iran, the peaceful transition of power in Kenya. And China also, for example, opening up a bit and uh, approaching the foreign relations with a softer voice and a more collaborative style than we've seen in the past years. So I think for me, this current of undercurrent of a better multilateralism, I think is a sign of hope for the future. And on that note, the president of our main multilateral body in the world, the United Nations General Assembly, is now Saba Kurosi of Hungary. He's the president of the 77th Assembly, a Hungarian diplomat. He has also served as a state secretary of the office of the president of Hungary. He has had many related uh, sustainability related posts, such as being founding member of the Hungarian Scientific Panel on Climate Change, permanent invitee to the Presidential Committee on Sustainable Development and at the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. Also, he was co-chair of the open working group that 
on the sustainable development goals that were actually the group that invented the SDGs and the 2030 agenda for the 2015 decision. And his slogan is solutions through solidarity, sustainability, science. And I cannot think of a better way to close this inspiring uh, panel discussion by listening to his message to us that uh, that uh, we received and has been recorded. So let's try to play this recording and thank you very much for joining. Dear friends, in our quest for sustainability, Isaac Asimov, the American biochemist and science fiction writer once said, no sensible decision can be made any longer without taking into account not only the world as it is, but the world as it will be. He was right. The decision which path to follow now will have a direct impact on the fate of the forthcoming generations of humankind too. Yes, we have entered the Anthropocene era in the history of the Earth. But are we up to the tremendous responsibility of being the main shapers of life on our globe? We usually make our decisions with the assumption that we have the relevant information for the best possible outcome. Let me draw a parallel. If you need to cross a road and there is no traffic light, you assess the flow of cars. There are several factors for you to evaluate. The number of cars, the distance between them, their speed, the width of the road, the number and the location of banana peels, your abilities to walk, even the possibility of a police officer showing up. What we know is that in our world today, we need to get to the other side of the road. As on our side of the road, conditions for life and civilization are becoming unsustainable. The other side that is more sustainable, peaceful, respectful, inclusive, socially more just, and therefore better for the current and future generations of humanity, and their only home, this fragile blue planet, just as we agreed. In our real world, the cars are the wars, the blatant disrespect for human rights, the depletion of our resources, the inadequate education of our children, the growing inequality of distribution of food and other resources, and most alarmingly, the worsening water and climate crisis. It would be self-deception to expect that a friendly policeman will suddenly show up in 2023. In fact, in 2020, we had a sort of policeman called COVID-19. It introduced to us the prototype of the Anthropocene era crisis. But even that was not enough to cause a speedy transformation. Despite our joint promise, we gave earlier in the SDGs, the Addis Ababa Protocol and the Paris Agreement. In 2023, we are providing science briefings to the UN General Assembly, the world's number one deliberative and policy-making body, an institution comprising 193 member states with a combined constituency of 8 billion people. We hope to see a coalition of scientists that can advise the assembly in shaping key decisions and validate how sustainable their implementation is. How fast we are crossing the road and how many cars are approaching. 
we will have the UN Conference on Water in March to agree and decide on game changers for water and resilience, new financing models for water, and a global water information system are both key elements of our new integrated water and climate agenda. We will review our progress regarding the Sendai framework in May to lock in early warnings for all, as well as risk assessment and mitigation. The SDG summit in September will be the, the moment to synthesize it all for the whole sustainable development agenda and to put the world on a beyond the GDP track with scientific guardrails approved by the international community. Dear friends, we have to focus on the future. We cannot get through the road based on how many cars went by yesterday. We can't build traffic lights. It would take too long to agree on where to put them and on the side that will pay for them. But we can get our act together and provide the basic scientific guidance we all need to cross the road. The road that divides humanity's demise from its second chance. Please join me in this endeavor. While doing so, I ask you to be mindful of the limitations of our knowledge, but all the same, to be resolute because time is evidently not on our side. How to do that? How to resolve the basic dilemma of the 21st century? Well, to quote the immortal words of Hamlet, that is the question. And it is with this question that I wish you thought-provoking discussions. I sincerely hope to get positive, impactful and game-changing outcomes from your deliberations. Good luck and a happy new year to all of you. Thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, all of you who've attended today, who've asked questions, who've listened to all these really uh, wonderful and fascinating insights. And I hope that you all take this forward in your own work this year and, and, and think about these things with us. Uh, thanks again. Sorry, we're a little bit over time, but I think it was worth it to, to hear that final address. Uh, please take care. Have a, a great 2023.